August 2021, spa Francorchamps, Belgium. A truly great circuit, home to some of the best corners in motor racing, and a second home for Max Verstappen fans to suffocate innocent bystanders with their orange mist. Truly a great place for a race. Only on this particular race day, the conditions looks like this. <laughs> And what this deluge meant was that after hours of debating, the race was cancelled after one lap just in case someone drowned. Half points were awarded for the hard fought couple of laps behind the safety car, and fans were subsequently told to bugger off. This left a very bitter taste in the mouths of, well, everyone. Some calling it the worst race in Formula One history. But you can't really call this a race. A race actually requires, you know, racing. Although something that generated as much controversy and that you could call a race, sort of, happened back in 2005. Indianapolis Motor Speedway, the United States Grand Prix. Passionate fans had turned out in their masses to witness the pinnacle of motor racing in their own backyard. Some coming from all parts of the Americas. To watch a title fight, they could very well see the Ferrari dynasty put in its ass. To watch a political shambles that threatened to curtail Formula One's American market, which was said to be vital for the sport's future. A colossal screw-up that threatened the very existence of the sport itself. To watch 14 cars retire before the race starts, and only six cars take to the grid. What the hell happened? Well, in this video, we'll find out the answer. Right after a word about the sponsor of this video, Surfshark VPN. As the world becomes more dependent on tech as we continue our gradual ascent toward the cyborg age, more and more things end up being at the mercy of the internet. Everything from keeping in touch with your loved ones, to internet banking, to catching up with your favorite YouTubers when they can actually get around to releasing stuff. Now, we all want our information to be secure, right? The last thing we want is for some manas to make life difficult thanks to inadequate security, right? Well, that's where Surfshark comes in. It's a VPN service that protects all your information that you send through the internet by encrypting all the data. That way, those aforementioned manas will be kept at bay. And there's something else too. Depending upon where you are in the world, content can be restricted. With Surfshark, however, you can bypass that by simply changing your location. Not only is this good for people who want to keep up with their favorite shows or their favorite YouTubers, but it can also be a critical tool for those who live in countries that for whatever reason want to censor the people. It ain't quite teleportation, but it is about as close as we're going to get right now. So Surfshark are going to give you all a neat little offer here. By using my link in the description and using the promo code Josh Revel, you can get Surfshark VPN for 83% off and three extra months for free. Full on protection for like, what, a couple of bucks a month? Nice. Plus three free months, and they offer a 30 day money back guarantee as well. So give it a try and thanks once again to Surfshark for sponsoring this video. In 2004, Michael Schumacher was the king of the hill. He just wrapped up a 7 millionth world title and Ferrari themselves were looking indomitable. That year, the car was an absolute demon on the track and there was no sign that the Fidardisi train would be slowing down. Although, as is the case in motorsport, eventually the dynasty has to meet its end. Eight rounds into the 2005 championship, it was Renault versus McLaren and Ferrari weren't really in the title picture. Fernando Alonso had a huge lead over second place man Kimi Raikkonen, who was in prime Kimi mode at that point. In other words, he was running faster than six month old cheese. Schumacher, meanwhile, was down in fifth. Behind Jano Trulli and Nick Heidfeld. Part of the reason for why Ferrari were drowning that year was down to the tyres. You see, back in those days, Jesus, I'm making this sound ancient, aren't I? There were two tyre manufacturers in Formula 1, Bridgestone and Michelin. Ferrari were one of three teams using Bridgestone rubber. Yes, there were differences in performance of the tyres and in 2005, there was a new rule in place where tyre changes during the race were banned. If there were safety issues during the race pertaining to the tyres, however, you could change one. But, like, literally only one single tyre could be changed and, like, that's it. I don't know who came up with that rule, but it seemed like the type of person to fill out a Sudoku puzzle with letters. As good as their intentions were, it was a very stupid rule to have drivers out on track at the mercy of rubber without having a safe word. And already that year, it had proven to be a rancid rule. So, 200 miles of racing needed to be covered on one set of tyres. Keep this in your memory bank because we'll come back to this later. The point is, however, Michelin had delivered a better tyre compared to Bridgestone in terms of outright performance. And that meant that everyone on that French rubber was yeeting off into the sunset while Michael and Rubens were sitting there wondering how in the hell have we fallen off this badly after 2004. Alonso and Raikkonen, meanwhile, seemed to be odds on favourite for the title. Their momentous scrap in Monaco sort of set the tone. And while you could argue that Kimi did look the faster driver, the MP420 had an unhealthy obsession of breaking itself mid-race. Of the first 
eight races that year. Four were won by Fernando, three by Kimi, and one by Blad here. I don't mean to be mean to Fissy, but Alonso really dunked him on his head in this time. And for the next few races, it did seem that the trend would continue, but oh boy, are you in for a treat. The host for the ninth round of the championship was in the land of the free, and the home of the greatest athlete to have ever walked the damn earth. He's got nothing to do with Formula One, but he wouldn't need explaining for what happened this day because Bo knows. Formula One has had a crush on America for the longest time, but America didn't really have a crush on it. I mean, aside from the 1960s and 70s where America had the likes of Dan Gurney, Phil Hill, Richie Ginther, Peter Revson, Mark Donahue, Mastin Gregory, and Mario Andretti on the grid, and having two world champions in Hill and Andretti, there was no American on the grid in the mid-2000s, and by 2005, the last American to be on the grid was Michael Andretti in 1993. They tried staging races in Watkins Glen, Sebring, Riverside, Long Beach, Phoenix, Detroit, Dallas, and Las Vegas, and they tried to bring the circuit to places such as New York and San Francisco. Some of them did well, and some of them couldn't outsell a local ostrich festival. But until recently, with the advent of Drive to Survive, Liberty Media, and cat-headed YouTubers, the appetite for Formula One in America did not match what Formula One was hoping it would. Still, the Indianapolis Motor Speedway played host to the United States Grand Prix, and honestly, was probably one of America's better Formula One venues. In a lot of ways, this is actually just straight up one of the best racing venues in the world. So much history, so much mystique about the place, and deceptively challenging. But like most, well, nah, all racing venues around the world, eventually, it gets repaved every once in a while. The diamond cut surface was as smooth as mob. Oh, no, I can't do that one. Um, it, it was smooth as a cam. Oh, no, I can't do that one. It was smooth. That's all you need to know. In a number of ways, diamond cut surfacing is a great way of paving a racetrack, but in one way, it's not so great. Tire wear is a lot more noticeable, and running a harder compound to mitigate the issue is kind of advised if you don't want to die or something. And when the Indy 500 was run a month prior, there didn't seem to be any issues here. Although this event did kind of play a role in what was to come, but more on that later. So yeah, it's mid-June, and the Grand Prix circus has arrived at Indianapolis. First practice session is topped by one Pablo Montoya in the McLaren, while Ferrari are stuck in the mid-pack. Although in the long runs, they do look kind of decent, while the other Bridgestone runners of Jordan and Minardi are drowning at the back. Although they'd be doing that anyway no matter what rubber they were on. It kind of seemed like same old, same old for the Bridgestone runners in a way. But then things started to take a dramatic turn. Going through the final corner in the second practice session, Ralph Schumacher's left rear tyre lets go on him and slams him into the barrier. Coincidentally, it was the same place of which he crashed last year, where he broke his back and was forced out of the race. While this injury wasn't nearly as bad as that one, he was ruled out for this race too. He was replaced by team's reserve driver, Ricardo Zonta. But that's okay. Zonta isn't a half bad driver and his times in free practice suggested that he'd be fine. So maybe two Toyota will be fine here? Except for the fact that in the first practice session, when Zonta was in the spare car, his tyre failed too. So to be told, hey yeah, I know you were only going to do one session this weekend, but we now need you to do the race as well, even though we know the tyres are munted, you down? Uh, sorry, what was your question? Up and down the pit lane, other Michelin runners were reporting similar issues regarding wear on the left rear tyre, saying vertical cuts on the sidewall of the left rear were present. And by now, people were starting to wonder, hang on, what the hell is causing this? Is it the tyre itself? Is it the Toyota car or its setup? Uh, has a local witch put a curse on the track or something? Well, despite the abrasive nature of the surface, as well as the high tyre loading going through that bank corner, Michelin had told FIA race director Charlie Whiting that they had no clue as to why the tyres had failed. Wait, what? What do you mean you don't know? They initially thought the teams were running them underinflated, but this turned out not to be the case. They then asked the teams to run Saturday practice sessions with higher tyre pressures on lighter fuel, and not to use them too much at all really. Basically, do an outlap, then come straight back into the pits again. Only Montoya and David Coulthard had actually set a time in amongst the Michelin runners, but even then, there were issues. What Michelin did know, however, was that they could not guarantee that the tyres would last beyond 10 laps. And with the race being 73 laps long, and unable to change tyres via the regulations, everyone in unison went, Huh. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, that's a problem. At this point, though, qualifying had been run, and it was Jano Trulli on pole position, Raikkonen second, Jensen Button in third, and Fissi fourth. Schumacher and Barrichello were down in P5 and P7, respectively, and the Minardis and Jordans were drowning horribly, as per usual. What was the more pressing issue, however, was how in the hell this race was ever going to happen? After all, Michelin were not confident in those tyres lasting beyond 10 laps, never mind 73. So Michelin asked Charlie Whiting if the cars could be slowed down going through that last corner. You know, just to just to make sure that the Michelin runners could have a chance to race without the tyres exploding every which way. To which Whiting replied, Are you taking the piss? How is that fair to the Bridgestone runners who aren't encountering issues? This is your problem and your problem alone, so you fix it. Oof. Michelin responded by saying that they had the new specification of tyres, which should hold up to the banking and allow them to go racing, but they would have required approval from the FIA, who at this stage were being about as accommodating as 
Amber Heard. Problem was that big boy Flav here said that if the new specs weren't permitted, that Renault would not be racing. Well, another option put forward was a chicane just before the corner. This would slow each and every car down so there was no discrepancy between the Bridgestone and Michelin runners. Everybody wins, yeah? Not according to the FIA or Charlie Whiting. They shot that idea down real fast and now, when everyone turned up on Sunday morning, there was no chicane. There was no speed limit for the Michelin shot cars going through the final corner. There was no allowance for them to pit every 10 laps with new tyres, as was suggested. There was no solution. And yet, here they were on the grid, with many thousands in the grandstands, ready to watch 20 cars go at it for a couple of hours. Nine teams had agreed to the chicane, but there was no chicane there, and there wasn't going to be one there anytime soon. This drew the ire of Paul Stoddart, who, despite being in with a good shot of some points, and ultimately a big wad of cash at the end of the year thanks to the Constructors Race Lottery Bonanza, showed solidarity with the Michelin runners, saying that if they don't race, we don't either. I don't care if Christian Albers won't get his maiden podium. Formula One needed to come together and not become a political train wreck with internal fighting and a depleting fan base. We have baseball for that. They were on the grid though and off they went on their formation lap. They were contractually obliged to do so. But what the hell was going to happen next? Here they all are, warming their tyres up, getting ready for racing and then to add more spice to this already overcooked sh cake. Cawthard says this over the radio. If that is the case, that they're still in decision with the team principles, again if it comes down to my choice, I want to race. Whoa! Hey! Look. What? Gonna leave it up to the drivers, are ya? Still in discussions, are ya? Feeling lucky today, are ya? You big chin schlub. Well, all of this came to naught when, at the end of the formation lap, one by one, all the Michelin shot cars came into the pits to retire the cars. The crowd in the stands stood aghast, wondering what the hell was going on. After all, this was before a time that F1 Twitter was around. But it wasn't all good news, because this left a lot of people in the dark. At least, until now. Disgust. Anger. Or in the case of the Indian fans, delight as Karthi Kane could be on for a podium here. But whoa, hang on, wait, 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 wait. Why are the Jordans out there? And why are the Minardis out there too? Didn't they both agree not to race? Standing in solidarity with the Michelin teams? Well, it turns out that Colin Collies, Jordan's head honcho and shaved bison, reneged on that agreement and told his drivers Narain Kartikeyan and Thiago Montero to stay out on the track. Bernie Eccleston and Bridgestone may have had a hand in that, but Stoddart saw this and regrettably asked Albers and Freesacker to stay out too. Meanwhile, the Ferrari stood alone at the front of the grid and we had this entirely ridiculous scenario of only six cars on the grid. The lights went off and we were racing. Apparently. And immediately, the Jordans started smoking like Keke Rosberg in the 80s. Had these two characters gone out, Stoddart claimed he would have retired both his cars thereafter. Tch, yeah, bullsh**. Not when there's millions on the line. But on planet Earth, to everyone watching this in the grandstands and at home, no one could quite believe what in God's name we were watching. This was unprecedented. Not even the 1982 San Marino Grand Prix was this ridiculous. Lap one complete, then lap two. And by now, the masses in the grandstands were beginning to understand exactly what the f was happening. This wasn't a parade. This was the race. This? Five cars and Patrick Freesacker? For a time, there were talks that the Michelin shot cars could re-enter the race, but what's the point? The Minardis and Jordans were slower than the KFC drive through on Friday, but you can't make up two to three laps in the time left. It's over. On track, there wasn't much of anything happening aside from the Ferraris running away, Montero and Albers battling for third, Carthy Kane keeping a watching brief, and Freesacker poodling around, barely keeping inside the top six in a six-car race. This didn't make Stoddard very happy, who knew the season was over for Minardi, because in reality, they were the slowest of the slow. And realistically, this was going to be their only time to score points, and he made his position on the race pretty freaking clear on Dutch comms. This is f***ing crazy. The FIA needs to get a grip with itself and sort this sport out before there's no sport to sort out. This today is bullshit. The championship's over for Minardi. We were only fighting Jordan. This bullshit race has meant that the season finishes here. We can't ever overtake the points from today. You know, the, it's over. But if Mr. Aviation here was pissed, you can only guess how the fans were feeling. Booing the action, stomping the ground, and throwing bottles of water and beer onto the circuit. Now, on one hand, that sh was unacceptable. The danger imposed by throwing junk onto the racetrack was petty and beyond dangerous. But on the other hand, some of these characters had a damn good arm. There are five second 40 yard sprint away from being called into the NFL draft. As for the race itself, it was... Eh. Although it must be said, the Ferrari battle did get interesting. After fears regarding Schumacher's leave for a tire, his first pit stop took an eternity and gave Barrichello the lead. After the next lot of pit stops, Schumacher re-emerged alongside Barrichello heading into turn one. Michael Schumacher being Michael Schumacher, he saw Rubens looking at the lead in lust and Julie showed him just how green the Indy infield actually is. I must be honest, if these two had collided and taken each other out of the race, 
I mean, just imagine this podium. What we could have had had Michael just locked the front right. The butterfly effect would have been strong on that one. Oh my God. After those pit stops, however, it was a procession. Both drivers were told to hold station and Schumacher went on to take his and Ferrari's only win of the season. Barrichello was second and Tiago Montero took third to become the first and today only Portuguese driver to stand aloft the podium. On that podium, it was a somber atmosphere and no one was happy to be there. Except for Tiago who couldn't give two flying the watching world had lost faith in the sport because ultimately, and perhaps rightly, he drew the conclusion that it was a Michelin issue and not his issue. And Colin Collins, head honcho of Jordan, said equally that that's racing. Oh. Oh. Oh no. But when all said and done, those fans in the grandstands, they weren't just there from Indianapolis, Indiana. They weren't just there from the US. Some came from Canada. Some came from Mexico, Colombia, Panama, all over the Americas. And to be given this was a slap in the face to all of them. So what in the hell caused all of this? Why did they not go racing? Why did they not implement a chicane to go racing? I mean, after all, they were about ready to go with it, with Bernie Eccleston and IMS owner Tony George sussing out a makeshift chicane for them to use, getting ready to move the tyre bundles used for the Porsche Cup over toward turn 13. Well, that was shot down on safety grounds by Charlie Whiting, and it was also shot down by Ferrari Jean Todd, who basically said, it's a Michelin problem, not ours. And can you really blame Ferrari and Bridgestone in this? After all, with all the problems that Bridgestone were having previously, Michelin were not willing to accommodate then, so why should Bridgestone start now? There's something else too. That chicane that was proposed was not going to be one of those nice ones with curbs and pretty paint and so forth. It was just dead ass going to be a bunch of tyres. Now, there was something similar back in 1994 after the tragedy at San Marino. In Spain that year, they installed a tyre bundle chicane in the second sector on safety grounds and to this day remains by far and away the worst chicane in all of human history and remember we had this guy back in 2019 but so hold up how come Bridgestone didn't have the same issues as Michelin the answer could be found a month prior to the Grand Prix at the same circuit the Indy 500 ran without a hitch with the Firestone tires holding up well Firestone, the company owned by Bridgestone. The gist of it is this. Firestone had all the data from the Indy 500 that year, and all that data ended up in the hands of Bridgestone, who saw that the tyre dig was going to be a little more intense this year than it was in 2004, and so came equipped with more durable tyres for the event. It was also kind of aided by the fact that Bridgestone were more conservative with the construction of their tyres than Michelin were. So, they had this information. Michelin did not. Not that it was Bridgestone's problem, if we're totally honest, but the main player in this whole debacle that made life difficult, and was ultimately singled out as the villain in this whole piece was this guy, Max Mosley. Mosley flat out refused to allow a chicane to be put in, saying that if it was done, the FIA would not accept it as an FIA race. And if it wasn't an FIA sanctioned race, it would not be part of the world championship. Ultimately, he refused to cave into the pressure of the Michelin gang. Michelin even offered to run without points, or if needs must, they'll just run through the pit lane every lap, bypassing the bank corner, but going slow enough to finish behind all the Bridgestone runners. Except maybe Patrick Friesacker, but still, no dice. In the days after the chicken flag had fallen, the amount been flung around made the atmosphere feel like a Moroccan zoo. The World Motorsport Council found the seven Michelin teams guilty of failing to ensure that they were in possession of suitable tyres for the 2005 US Grand Prix, but with strong mitigating circumstances, and of wrongfully refusing to allow their cars to start the race, having regard to their right to use the pit lane on each lap. Michelin themselves, meanwhile, compensated fans at the venue with refunds, as well as purchasing 20,000 tickets for the 2006 race. They also gave ticket holders free entry into the Cleveland Champ Car round. Whoop de doo. Despite this, however, the race had completely damaged Formula One's image, especially in America. Formula One. Yeah. American Grand Prix. What oh, yes. in the name of all that's holy was that about? Frank Williams uh, was quoted as saying, you know, the atmosphere stinks in Formula One at the moment. Well, I mean, uh, it's been pretty smelly for quite a long time. The next two US Grand Prix were won by Schumacher and Lewis Hamilton. After that, however, Indianapolis never hosted another Grand Prix again, and Formula One in America was gone. They were close to a race along the Hudson on a track that reeked of sh about as badly as the sewage treatment plant that had passed, but Formula One would not return to the US until 2012 when they began racing in Austin, Texas. The lingering memory of 2005, however, still lives on. But briefly going back to when Colin Collins said, that's racing? Was it? I mean, yeah, I say that sh all the time. And yes, in this game, sometimes stuff doesn't go your way and you have to accept it. Whether it's fair or not, that's the nature of the game. But a solution could have been found. They could have all been racing, albeit under weird, massively f***ed up circumstances. But racing nonetheless. Instead, what we got almost killed Grand Prix racing in America, which is what they were so desperate to build on. It sounds strange to say that now, given that since Liberty Media purchased Formula One, the popularity of Formula One in America has never been better. We'll now have three Grand Prix on the calendar, with Austin, Miami, and Las Vegas. And and unlike the 80s, where there were more people on the grid than there were in the stands, the popularity is there. Have the scars of 2005 healed? Bugger if I know. I mean, we're still talking about it after all. It's always used as a benchmark when comparing FIA ups. Has Formula One subsequently pulled itself out of the dirt and gotten into a nice, stable relationship with the United States of processed cheese? 
Yeah, you could say that it has. But was this the worst Formula One race of all time? Yeah. Yeah, you bet it was. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Drop a comment below, subscribe to the channel if you're awesome, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.